So I do just okay. want to start off, Larry, by telling you that uh, Sunday, when me yeah. and my dad, my brother Andy, my cousin <clears throat> Tom, we came out for a Larry Smith ice fishing adventure on Lake Winnebago, and I, you know, I, my dad doesn't get much happier than when he's just hammering I the saw perch. That smile. Yeah, he <laughs> did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I always like when we, you know. It wasn't, uh, it, it was, a, a, I got to just tell you something. The smile was slightly different than the smile I saw when you were the only one that did not land a sturgeon the last time we fished, <laughs> right? That was, I mean, it was a little different smile. It was, it was, it, the, the sturgeon episode was more like your dad had that, like he smiled at me and he kind of like glanced your way. And he just had that, like that smile went through like a little grin, like, you know, Confucius say, take time. Right? <laughs> yeah. It, uh... The stars were lined up that day, Charlie. And it's always nice when that happens because, you know, you're a fisherman. Your grandpa, Bob, you uh, love to fish Lake Winnebago. Of course, your dad do. But you don't like, you can't expect every time to go out purse fishing and get on them, you know? And our yeah. perch cycles have gone up and down over the years. And I would say right now we have the best perch population that we've had in 30 years. Well, that was pretty evident the other day. And you're right. It is a fish because, you know, you can go out and if you know, like the bluegills are kind of always going to be biting, right? The right. sunfish or whatever. But you get crappies and you get um, you get perch and perch especially. You're on them and you're off them. And my grandpa Bob would love to go out to you know, one of the reefs on Lake Winnebago and, and just sit there and uh, and tight line. And if the perch were biting, if he had a bucket of perch for the freezer, he was just a happy man, you know, that, that I, and he loved fishing uh, musky and northern doing all that, you know, putting the big bobber right. on uh, <laughs> or just casting or whatever. Uh, but it was perch. If he was doing anything, it'd be a sunny day on Lake Winnebago, not a lot of wind, and he could just sit on the perch all day long. That'd be heaven for him. In fact, that's what he's doing right now in heaven. I'm sure of it. You know. Well, I bet she's probably looking down at you, thinking that you know them eight to eleven inches you caught the other day are nothing <laughs> compared to the fifteen to eighteen inches he's catching up there. Right. right? And they're right. always biting. They're always right. Biting. That's but, the nice part about it. You know, Grandpa Bobby could have stayed down here a little bit longer. We got the best <laughs> population of perch we've had in thirty years. But no, you gotta go to the ultimate perch factory, heaven. You know, oh. he, he caught one too many uh sheephead uh I think, you know, and he just said, All right, I gotta go someplace house for a little bit one place yeah. where there that's probably about the only place on the planet that there is not a sheep set <laughs> right yeah yep heaven there, there are no no sheep head or mosquitoes in heaven yeah that's wow i mean that's uh well that's well i guess real simple that's why they call it heaven <laughs> uh, no but uh okay so let's address uh what you brought up about the sturgeon so i'll t i'll give everyone my side of the story so a year ago <laughs> a year ago i got my dad a very good son got his dad a fishing trip uh with larry Great smith son. and uh we you took us to the wolf river you said charlie the walleyes are biting on the wolf and i said okay my dad loves walleyes let's let's do that he'd be thrilled we're out there for, uh, what, six hours, some seven hours. Yep. And the first and part, of, first part of the day, I don't think we got much of a fish, maybe one or two here or there. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah. But then, uh, I think it was Billy or John hooked onto something big. And we had a few of those. It was, John. It yep. was John. We had a few like, oh, this is, a uh, this is. It's, it feels like a log, but it's fighting. Snap the line. Uh, but then John, first one to hook into a sturgeon. And uh, and 45 minutes, he's bringing that sucker up. And you guys are coaching him. My dad's sitting there yelling, don't horse it, damn it. you know. And you guys are saying that in a nicer way. And then it's uh, 45 minutes of bringing it up. We're all watching in amazement. You know, you Mickey Mouse, uh, do the Mickey Mouse ears on the hole because it's such a big fish. And, right. um, and then he brings it up. It's, it's amazing where we're looking at it. It's cool. Puts it back. And then all of a sudden, everybody 
is hooked into a sturgeon, myself included. They, like, moved into that, that we were in a deep hole. They moved into that hole, and they had to be a hundred of them in there. They were thick. They were thick. And, and so thick, at one point, every single one of us had a sturgeon on the line. As it turns yeah, you guys out, actually crossed lines a couple times. I'm surprised they didn't all get all get tangled up. Yeah, yeah, because that's exactly. So I had a sturgeon on my line. Okay, I did, and I see that look on your face. And don't you don't. I am not saying anything at all. I'm going to let you go <laughs> to tell, tell your story because this is your podcast. Okay, I'm so... going to do my own podcast, and well, five minutes after we're done, <laughs> and tell the real story. <laughs> Right. So, so so me and Billy, I see Billy, I see Billy, uh, I don't know, 30 yards away in another hole. And, and after fighting this sturgeon for like 15 minutes, I'm reeling up as I see Billy going, ro- his pull goes down and then, and then Billy rolls up and my pull goes down. I'm like, Oh no, we just have each other. So I didn't catch a sturgeon. I caught Billy, but I like to think the sturgeon on my line just rat was just mating or kissing or something Billy's sturgeon and then our our so I do like to think I didn't just catch my brother under the ice like a terrible little rascals episode I think that I did have a sturgeon on and Billy screwed it up for me how does that sound well all I gotta say is I hope your hand is not on a bible <laughs> Because, you know, lightning can make it through that hotel room. You do know that. <laughs> right. Right. Oh, so, man, that's, that... uh, so that's the sturgeon story. Right? That's the sturgeon story, I guess. Okay. It was a lot of fun out there. We Everybody brought up a sturgeon at the end of the day. Billy ended up hooking into another one. He brought one up. My dad... It, it it took John uh, 45 minutes uh, to get that sturgeon up. My dad, who spent all of that time telling John, don't horse it, John, was horsing the hell out of his sturgeon. And I never saw him horse a sturgeon. He brought it up in like 13.2 minutes. So Your was... dad is, is a master. You know, here's the deal. Your dad's a master at fishing. Um, and he, this is the way I'm, I'm, I was watching your dad all the while here. Your dad figured he had perfect tension. He fought that fish just absolutely perfect, and he wore the beast out to get it out of the hole, get the pitcher. And I think all he was thinking about is that I pray that I'm going to get mine out, that my son Charlie can get his line back down there and <laughs> finally hook another one and get it out, right? That's yeah. exactly your dad's always thinking about you, kid, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he is. He's thinking about who's going to clean the fish when we get home. That's what he's thinking about. But, <laughs> That's why you had all you kids. I know. I know. Do you believe this, though? Uh, all those perch, we got 39 perch. Guess who cleaned all of them? Your dad. He cleaned them all. He cleaned he them did? all. Can, yeah, he Holy did. Holy man. I was, was going to, because we had a family party that night, so I put some ice on them. It was cold enough outside. I uh, left him in the garage, and uh, I was going to come over the next morning to help him. I even called him early, and he said, um, he said, I cleaned him. So that's huh. good, because I was kind of bluffing in my in my effort, too. I was going to be like, you know, I, I want to get over there, but I got to get out of town for a show. Sorry. Yeah, I got to get a pedicure or something, right? <laughs> All right. There's something got, something that, that's going on that I got to do, right? Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. All right. L- Larry, I want to get into uh, like how you got started in this whole deal. Can you like take us from where you were born and how you got interested in doing this thing? Give us the child, the origin story of Larry well, you, Smith. Well, you got it. So here's how it all happened. Um, I uh, grew up um, basically on Lake Winnebago in Oshkosh and uh, just have always been addicted to fishing. I mean, it's just been one of them kind of things, and I say this all the time that you know, everybody's addicted to something. Like, I, I take it you're drinking coffee. So yeah. That's probably your addiction, right? I you got know, a few, but yeah, addiction. that's one. Right, yeah. <laughs> right, right. We'll start with the coffee, right? <laughs> um, and so, you know, fishing has always been very special to me. And so really how the whole thing started with me is that when I was about 17, I started fishing local tournaments with a friend of mine, and we started doing pretty good at them. And uh, I was, uh, we were fishing a tournament in Oshkosh and a guy came up to me and said, Hey, I've been watching you guys for a couple of years and I own a business 
and want to know if you want one of the to guide some of my customers because uh, that's the kind of things they like to do. And I never really thought about guiding. And so I, he gave me his number and I thought about it for, you know, a week and I gave him a call back and mm -hmm. said, sure. And uh, that's kind of really how the whole guiding part started is really off the tournament. And then I started getting a few sponsors and my first sponsor that I ever uh, got was HT Tackle out of Campbellsport. And uh, I started doing some, some stuff with them, some promotion stuff like that and one day they're like hey uh we just uh we got a new line of open water rods coming out and uh we want to promote these and we're going to start doing some marketing through john gillespie and i really i knew john but i didn't know i mean i watched his show a few times um <clears throat> so anyways i went out and uh, we f filmed uh a tv show out in off of lake winnebago uh, right off of actually Menominee Park and just got lucky as one of them days the wind was right and we just knocked it out of the park so I started filming a lot of shows with him and then it kind of led to you know I pretty much over my uh, career film with probably almost every person in the Midwest that has a, a Midwest TV show and I thought to myself you know you know I gotta back up a little bit um, so that I was actually driving semi uh, and guiding part time. And here's how that all kind of went. I was at the last two and a half to three years, I ended up working probably anywhere from 70 to 80 hours a week between the guiding part and driving semi. And it just got to the point where the guiding business got so crazy that I, you know, took a gamble and said, I'm just going to guide full time. And so I started guiding full time. And, and uh, that was a little scary, you know, giving up a good job, you know, giving up all that, all these benefits, you know, and uh, jumping into the guiding world and being self-employed. But uh, 32 years later, um, you know, we're still living in that trailer house. God, I love that trailer house, you know. But uh, so the, the guiding <laughs> part did work out for me. But mm -hmm. here's the deal about Six years ago, uh, I started my own show just because I, I just thought, you know, all the people that I filmed with were really good people and they all had their niche, but I didn't see like none of the gut people that I filmed with were people that fished every day like I did. I just thought, you know what, maybe I can give a little bit different angle to the, an outdoor show and be really more diverse too, and just try to do something different, you know, and in the part about like with our show is that we film with a lot of people, like, you know, people will email us or call us and, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk with them and they'll have something good going on. And sometimes these episodes, sometimes these situations work and sometimes they don't, but we always get something positive out of it. And I have always said this, is that the, the, my favorite part about the show is all the different people that we meet and all the great relationships that we built with people. You know, that's, that's the, the, the joy that I get out of, you know, the, 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 the television part of it. Yeah, definitely. And, and watching the show, I think, you know, it, it's just, I, it's clear your passion, your joy for it. I mean, your, your tagline, it's a great day to be alive. You know, I mean, it's, uh, it, it just goes to like the heart of fishing while you're out there. Like we're alive, we're celebrating, we're, we're, we're in God's country doing, doing what, <laughs> what was basically, we've got all the, the, just taking advantage of what's there and you connect in a different way. I think to yourself and to other people when you're like away from your phone and you're just out outdoors doing the thing. Um, yeah. It's like, I always think of this, you know, you think about, um, all the stress in life, you know, I mean, some people have stress, you know, they might be going through something with cancer, some people have financial stress. Uh, there's always a lot of things that, you know, that you have going on and everybody needs a place to get away and to just to decompress. And I think the outdoors are definitely the place to do it, you know, and here's the other part is Charlie, you think about all the great memories that are built, you know, from fishing. Um, and you know, like if I'm sure, I just want to ask you, when you think of grandpa Bob, what, what really experiences and what situations do you think of like you guys doing? I mean, it's 100% fishing. 100%. Yeah, see, yep. 
same thing here of my dad and my grandfather. Yep. Now, with your dad, uh, did you did you grow up fishing with him on Winnebago? Was he a big fisherman uh, himself? Yeah, he was a huge fisherman. Uh, we fished the wolf a lot. My dad kept a boat up there, and then we, of course, lived on Winnebago. So yeah, and then we, my dad ended up moving up to Lake Poygan, which of course, if people oh, aren't yeah. familiar with the Winnebago system, that's uh, you know one of the part of the upper part of the system here. Yeah, yeah. And so fishing is, what, you know, that's what we did. You know, we fished. And what did your dad uh, and, and mom do for a living? Uh, my mom stayed at home with us, and uh, my dad, he worked at a paper company. You know, this is kind of interesting. He worked at a paper company in in Manasseh. It was called Gilbert Paper Company. Forty four years he worked there, and he never missed one day of work ever. Forty four years, and then he also he worked swing shift. You know. So yeah. he also had a drywall business on the side. And, uh, you know, I always think back in any time that we had any time, if there was an hour, three hours, four hours, uh, we went fishing. That's what we oh, did. Yeah. You know, I mean, we just, and my dad, he was, my dad was probably like most people of that generation. My dad, we never threw anything back. We kept uh. sheephead, we kept carp, we kept bullheads. I mean, he, we did not let anything go it didn't matter if it was a, a 12 inch walleye or if it was a 26 inch walleye it got thrown in in the live well so i'll tell you this situation real quick so one day when i started i was telling you i, I got into tournament fishing so one day i'm this is when i was i was already out of the house and uh yeah my dad i told him i'm going to come up to poigan and pre-fish up there and i said you want to come along because my dad was a really good fisherman and he's like yeah so anyways so we're up there and we're, we're pitching uh, jigs and crawlers on some structure and, and my dad catches like a 26 inch wall and maybe it's 24, maybe it's 28, whatever. Anyways, he gets it in, you know, and I'm like, Ooh, these are the kind of fish you couple of these during a tournament. You're going to, it's going to be a winner. So I looked at the fish. I threw it back in the water. My dad looked at me. And I don't want to swear on, on this podcast, but you know what he said? <laughs> a lot of words that started with F, right? <laughs> so he just infer he was wild. And I said to him, hey, 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 you know what? I might catch that fish during the tournament. And he went on with a whole spiel that that fish will never bite again, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, for the next three, four hours, he never said one single word to me. <laughs> so this is the deal. So I was. I, I picked him up at his house. I pulled right up there. I was launched at a, a landing down in Winnick County. Anyway, so I took him back to his house, and he jumped up on the dock, and I handed him all his, all his stuff. And I'll never forget this. My dad passed away now. I'll never forget this. He looked at me, and he looked at me, and he was just absolutely ticked about me. We caught our limits of eating walleye, you know. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, if you're ever pre-fishing for another tournament, don't you even think about calling me. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was wild yeah you know just one of them kind of things where he just it was not acceptable to that man to let a fish go yeah it's that old yeah. school mentality my, my kill grandpa, everything right like right. yeah because and then uh, yeah so you'd you'd clean the uh the what'd you do with the sheep head would he would he uh smoke them or what well we smoked some of them but we also if they were smaller ones we filleted them Right. Oh, and, did you? Uh, yeah. We'd make patties out of them too, grind them up and make fish patties out of them too. I, I have to admit to people, especially on the fish patty part, they are not that bad to eat. At really? All. So no, if they're not. I mean, anytime I get a sheephead, uh, I'm I'm letting it go. My grandpa Bob used to feed the pelicans uh, the sheephead. Yeah, we we'd be out there uh, fishing, and I probably shouldn't say this because this is no longer uh, okay anymore. Just but he would. Yeah, we'd be out there fishing. Uh, he'd get a sheep head. He would, uh, you know, and then he'd uh, bounce it he'd, off the motor. He'd do something. Kill it. I don't know what he'd do. That's the I old saw school him thing. Out there. <laughs> he did it right I in front that. of you. I was like, Grandpa, right. you can't do that. And he's got blood right. all over his shirt. And then, but he would he would wave it, and there'd be a one pelican. He'd throw it to the pelican. The pelican would eat it. By the time we were done fishing, he had a train of pelicans. Uh, 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 you always knew Grandpa Bob's boat because it was the one with the pelican farm right behind it, you know? Right. You would just feed he, those pelicans the whole 
with sheep head, you know? You know what? You just made me think of something. Now I understand why the last couple of years there's not quite as many pelicans on Winnebago. <laughs> they obviously have have relocated and found herself another Grandpa Bob, right? I'm go, you know, here's there's something to think about, folks. This it's amazing how intelligent Mother Nature is, right? In things of nature, obviously Grandpa Bob went to the big big house in the sky. And the Pelicans are like the following season. They're like flying around Lake Winnebago going, you know something? I knew Grandpa Bob. You know what? He was getting close, but I didn't realize that he actually left this planet. And they're like, you know what? They send to all their buddies. It's time, folks, to go to another lake. Right? <laughs> it's amazing we, how that yeah, works. You know? that, a, there were a lot of tearful <clears throat> pelicans on on that day. They they, right. they were, they're flying around looking for a, a, a new uh, father figure to feed them all day. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, now, and maybe and maybe that that's got something to do with uh, what happened a couple of years ago when your pontoon broke down for no reason. <laughs> oh, you know what? Crazy. It's amazing how that stuff works. You know, like, you know, maybe one of the Pelicans that didn't want to fly, you know, maybe another hundred miles to find another grandpa, Bob, he probably thought to himself when he saw that, that pontoon going by, you know what? I'm going to sabotage that thing today. <laughs> That's enough of that, right? I'm going to go crap on that mercury enough so it uh, it does something <laughs> to the uh, – well, that was funny. Mm. Yeah, we were out uh, We were out Winnebago, me and my dad. Uh, I, I think it was just me and my dad. Uh, maybe my grandma was with us. I can't Your grandmother remember. was there too, yes. She yes, was. She was. And, yep. uh, yeah, boat just breaks down, and my dad's like, ah, oh, and he's trying to fix – you know, fix the motor and everything. Nothing's working. And uh, we're like, do we call the Coast Guard? What, what do we do? I was like, I got one better for you. I call up Larry Smith. And I say, Larry, where are you? He goes, oh, I'm on Winnebago. I was like, how close to Fond du Lac are you? And you I don't know how close you Nina. were. <laughs> and you're like, I'll be there. In t uh, it's about 20 minutes away. I'll be there in 10. <laughs> Uh, yep. No, thanks for that tow job. That, no, that, that's what that it's was, all about, for yeah, sure. That was real nice of you towing us back. So it looks like you're in a hotel room, huh? Yeah, I am. I actually think housekeeping was just knocking on the door. I Hopefully actually, it was housekeeping and not, not a flock of pelicans. Yeah, I know. <laughs> My opener's texting me, we're leaving in 15 minutes. I said, no, we're not. I'm on with Larry Smith. I just texted him. It's going to be 45 uh, cause we're going to Indy, Indianapolis today and not, he just realized we lose an hour. So I was like, well, we'll just have to uh, be a little later. So we better soundtrack. put the afterburners on. Oh, uh, right? we're fine. We have plenty of time. Okay. He's just, he's a, he's a good guy. He's a, a warrior. Um, but, uh, yeah, what, what I was going to ask, what was it about that mentality of my grandpa, Bob, of, of your dad, uh, not throwing fish back? Was that, uh, was that, a uh, uh, a post uh, depression uh, mindset of where if you have food, you got free food here. You're not throwing it back. What was it about that mentality? I, I think you hit that a hundred percent for sure. But, you know, I think like nowadays, Charlie, we take for granted that most people, not all people, you know, don't get me wrong, folks, but most people have plenty to eat. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, there's, I would say there's, you know, there's, it's not like, I say this a lot. I never realized as a kid how poor we really were. You know, we, my dad, um, we only ever had one new vehicle ever, and it was an AMC Hornet, um, and it was not a very good vehicle. My dad only had one new shotgun, you know. So I just kind of look at, um, you know, and my dad was a hard worker. Like I said, he worked for 44 years, never missed a day of work, had a, another business on the side, drywalling. Um, but I don't think back then people made as much money, you know. And uh, so really, and a lot more mom stayed at home. So obviously you didn't have that double income coming in too. So, you know, yeah. things were a lot different back then. And I just don't, you never wasted anything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's kind of funny. It's like back then, 
you did a lot of bartering too with, you know, your neighbors, people that you knew, like if they were a good plumber, they would come over and do some plumbing for you. If you were a good mechanic, you know, and their car was broke, you would always barter things where nowadays it just seems like people have a lot more resources. We have a lot more goods, you know, I always, you know, you kind of think about that. You look at houses in general, like at one time, a 15 to 1800 square foot house, there was three or four or five kids in that house. You know, now people, you know, obviously 3,500, 5,000 square feet. And most people only have one child, you know, or, or mm-hmm. two child, two children if they're lucky. So, you know, it's just, you know, it's boy, things are totally different. I, I say this a lot, you know, being 54 plus that no doubt economically, we grew up in the best time that this country has ever had, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think back to the fishing part is that back then, again, the more, like you were saying, the more food that you had in your freezer and you never would waste anything, um, you know, the more secure you were, because I guess maybe it was, there was a lot more uncertainty back then too. Uh, You didn't know, you know, how long things were going to last, you know, it's just, it was definitely different times. I, and I think they were very good times myself. I just think, uh, it was a lot simpler back then too. Yeah. <clears throat> and from, uh, obviously now from an environmental, uh, perspective, a health of the fish population perspective, how has Winnebago, um, and it, for people who don't know Lake Winnebago, it's, uh, the biggest uh, inland freshwater uh, body. I believe it's the biggest, maybe Lake Champaign, is, is, is Champ- whatever that one is down in Illinois, maybe that one is bigger. But I think it's the biggest one next to the Great Lakes. Is that correct? Yeah, it's uh, it's the biggest inland lake in the state here for sure. I mean, it, it's uh, 11 and a half, uh, just the, the, the main lake itself, and there's several other lakes attached to it, 11 and a half miles wide by 34 long. A very shallow body of water, you know, like 16 to 20 feet, uh, and uh, it's it's a great body of water. You know, you're thinking, too, and, and you made me think about this, how different things are. Like, now everybody vacuum seals their fish if they're going to freeze them, or you put them in a Ziploc bag. Well, I don't, and I'm sure you do remember this, like, we used to, the, the, the old milk cartons that you would get, um, oh, they yeah. had actually wax inside of them. That's what we froze all the fish in back then. I remember yep. that. We didn't use, yeah. yeah, we didn't use anything but that. We would put the flays in there, put the water in there so it was covered up, and you would stack them in your freezer. Yeah. You know, so, you, again, you look at how different things are nowadays. You know, now you got fancy vacuum sealers and, and bags, and, you know, it's just like I said, uh, things are so much different nowadays than they were back then. But I think uh, when you look at overall what really is happening now is that, of course, with technology, everybody knows, for the most part, where the fish are biting, how they're biting. But now you're seeing a lot more people being very conservative. Um, most people don't keep, you know, like the main spawners, like walleyes that are over 18 inches to 24 inches. They let them go. You know, so when you look at things, you hopefully, and I do see a lot of this happening, things kind of balance them things up their cell salt were back in my dad's era and, and your dad and your grandfather um back then you didn't have the technology you didn't have the equipment you know so i i think fishing nowadays i mean is totally different than it was back then you know i mean you didn't you weren't you know you weren't as consistent as far as your catches as like you are now right so from that perspective it balances out because even though they were keeping a bunch they weren't wasting it, and they were uh, they just weren't catching as many. So that right, that there was it wasn't every time you went out that you caught fish for sure. Now we are in uh, sort of the tail end of ice fishing season. How how is how has the ice changed over the years? Um, because I was hearing stories about you know uh, just basically how the ice has changed. You know, from my grandpa and my dad or whatever. What's your perspective? You know, doing this for you know, 50 year, 50 years now. And, and, um, just seeing how it's changed. Not even that old. Well, you're 54, you said, right? 
Well, 54 plus, right? Yeah, 54. 54 oh, right. plus. But you've so been I, fishing I, I, since I you were four. I didn't start guiding at four. But anyways, we'll <laughs> get past that, that, that well, minor you, stuff like that. You right. were fishing. Right. You were In fishing. You know, I do dye my hair. Um, <laughs> I mean, so I didn't want to tell everybody out there that, right? <laughs> but, you know, uh, no doubt that obviously, you know, we used to get a lot more ice and it was more consistent. Like I always remember, you know, the day after – after Thanksgiving that we were already like walking out or taking, you know, uh, three wheelers back then. And always by right after Christmas, we were driving out, you know, vehicles out. But nowadays uh, this, it seems like our ice comes a lot later. And uh, this is probably that we have about 22 to 24 inches of ice this year out there. That's about the best ice I've seen in six years out there as far as thickness. And uh, the conditions have just been absolutely perfect. But we didn't start uh, ice guiding till the second week of January. Mm. So, again, you know, where we used to start the day after Christmas. So, I mean, it, it seems like our our winters are coming a lot later and they're a lot and they leave a lot sooner. Right. If yeah. That makes sense to anybody. Yeah, it does. And, you know, I mean, I think, you know, you look at uh, how the climate has been changing. That gets concerning for species like trout, which are very susceptible to uh, to warmer, um, warmer waters. Uh, they, right. they and muskies, uh, too. Like uh, when you're fishing musky, if it's a hot day out, uh, can you even really fish them? Because don't you when you bring them up, doesn't isn't that they're pretty well, much not going them back. Yeah. Yeah. You stress them out. You know, when like if, uh, you know, like last summer we had a stretch there that uh, in our musky fishing can really be good, especially up on the Bay of Green Bay or Pete and well. But we had a stretch there in, in August where it got pretty hot for about two or three weeks where that water temperature was up in that high 80s. And some sometimes they, in the middle of the day, it would crack that 90 mark. You definitely don't want to be fishing them fish then because when you hook them, you are going to stress them fish right out. And a lot of times you won't be able to revive them, you know? So, yeah. 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 So that's that, you know, you're always concerned about, you know, especially when you're fishing big fish, you got to realize that, yeah, you can wear these things all pretty fast. And it's, it's hard for a fish of that size in that age to, to recuperate, you know? Yeah. And I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a big, uh, environmental guy but not you know not like uh i feel like we got one planet right it's one home so saying you're being environmental right. like saying you know i'm trying not to crap in the sink these days you know right. i think people which is always a good idea yeah but i think right. you know we've kind of turned this into a uh uh right versus left thing when it comes to the environment but i don't think the politics should come into play at all it's just did do you want to keep catching uh muskies you know do you want to keep catching uh trout uh, per, you know, do you want these healthy systems? And I feel like, you know, you always do a good job of that, of, of, um, you know, say, you know, you do a lot of different types of fishing and you go with the appropriate seasons and, and all of that. And, um, and so I think that it's cool to see it, that the outdoors community is really responsive to trying to maintain a great environment for, uh, for these sports. And I, traditionally it's been the fishers and the hunters that have done a lot of good for the environment by keeping land sure. away from development because you want to have a healthy ecosystem and, um, the hunting and the fishing makes some people see that as anti-environmental, but truthfully, these are the people who are the most concerned about the environment. Is that your experience in your community? Well, that I, I think what you just said, you're a hundred percent right about that because most people that hunt and fish are really connected with what their surroundings are, what's going on. And obviously we all want to have good fisheries and keep them that way. So obviously being responsible doesn't matter if you lean to the left or lean to the right anyways, but being responsible because you look at the enjoyment, that, and that's really, I mean, you want to talk about left or right. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if you're left or right. You know, you still love the fish and, and a lot and hunt. So, again, it's, uh, it's one of them kind of things where, you know, you're always concerned about that. Here, uh, this is a number of years ago, my, my nephew uh, hunts mm -hmm. out by our farm out here, and I always tell them the big thing is that if you want to come hunting here, you before the hunting season, 
through the course of the summer and fall, early fall, you need to come out and do some work on the farm. And we were planting, I'm a huge tree planter. I don't know if you know that, know that or not, but yeah, to the a point where it's probably, I'm an, an extremist. Um, I plant an unbelievable amount of trees. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. So he was, he asked me, he said, uncle Larry, why are you always planting all these trees and doing all these things around your farm? You know, I said, because you know how much I love to hunt, you know? So you always got to be giving back. You can't just, it can't be just, it's just like fishing or hunting again. You can't just take, take, take and expect to, to, to keep and manage your resources and them to be plentiful unless you give back to it. And yeah. that, that's the great part about, you know, being an outdoors person is that you, yeah, you care about your environment. Hey, when you're driving, driving down the lake and you see something out there floating in the lake, 99% of the time, most of us just stop. And even though it didn't come out of our boat, we, we pick it up and throw it in our boat and throw it away. I mean, I don't want to see that in my, in my environment, you know, I mean, yeah. so, I mean, it's no different than, you know, the hunting part of it too. It's just, again, it goes back to this, Charlie, it's just being responsible and everybody getting along on this planet. Like I said, we only have one planet unless somebody else knows of another one that uh, we can get to, but we certainly don't want to destroy this one. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I think <clears throat> that's, uh, that's just a great thing. Great reminder for people when they're out there too, you know, I, and also I will say this, you see a can float and, uh, you know, that's worth uh, good money. You know, you take oh, that over to the recycle. Aluminum. Aluminum. Right. Yeah, that'll go. They need that. So it doesn't matter if it's a little bit rusted. It's fine, you know. So just uh, toss it. Well, it that does adds kind to of to the matter. weight of the can. <laughs> <laughs> right. Little iron. Iron's uh, uh, heavier than aluminum. Uh, so <laughs> so what's uh, what's kind of next for you? What, what are we looking at um, with this season coming up? Ice fishing's coming to an end. What are you excited to do this spring? Well, I'm excited uh, because uh, actually we are going to be going down in a couple weeks and doing some uh, saltwater fishing. Uh, but I'm also excited uh, still about a little bit of ice fishing because I'm going to break my airboat out and uh, do some because the, the fishing has been so good. We're going to do some uh, ice fishing. Uh, you know, once uh, the ice gets real bad in the shoreline where you can't access them. The only way to get out there is by an airboat. And uh, there's only one other person I know on the Winnebago system that has an airboat. So, you know, we're definitely going to take full advantage of that. But it's always nice just to see spring coming. Um, we're actually going to do some turkey hunting. We would love to have you come up to our farm in Minnesota and do some turkey hunting. Um, it's just a lot of fun. It's just a, a good get together. We cook a lot of food. Uh, you know, it's just a lot of good conversation and we have a lot of turkey. So we have that turkey hunting coming up. We've got a bunch of kids coming up there uh, at the end of April to do some hunting. But yeah, it's always nice to switch switch gears up a little bit, too. Definitely. Yeah. And, and that, that's also I kind of like this is uh, you can kind of, you know, I lived in Los Angeles for a little bit where it's 75 and sunny all day long. Uh, all year long, you know, and you don't realize how time passes, but you know, you can really keep, uh, that's kind of the cool thing about the Midwest is you can almost, um, be more in the moment cause things are always changing. So you always know where you sort of are in life, you know, as the seasons change and whatnot, that that's kind of, I, a I love the changing of the seasons, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of nice because, you know, now when you get, you know, a day like, and I think on Saturday for us, it's supposed to hit like close to 50. And boy, I'll tell you, it just, it feels like after having a good cold winter, a 50 degree day is like you're out there in a t-shirt pretty much, you know, it's, yeah. just, it's amazing how your body adapts to it too, the more time you spend outside too. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to, I saw, I got to tell you this, I, this morning, and this is a true sign of spring here in Wisconsin, at least for me, uh, yesterday I saw about four or five different flocks of geese uh, when I was out ice guiding. But this morning, I saw three sandhill cranes. And my wife and I always say, when we see sandhill cranes, pretty much you can write winter off. Not saying you might not get a snowstorm or two, but the stuff usually lasts a day or two and then it's gone. So the true sign of spring is definitely here. Those birds uh, tend the to know more train. than we know. Yeah, yeah, yep, exactly. Yeah, they do. Um, hey, I was going to ask what, you know, I grew up uh, listening to 
Tom Neubauer on the radio, you know. Tom and, Neubauer. Yep, yeah. Good guy. And then I, I grew up always watching the, the fishing shows as a kid Saturday morning. You know, we would watch them. I actually used to call in the uh, Tom show, actually, me and my brother. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, that what is the <clears throat> what role do you think the fishing guides, the fishing hosts have on Midwest culture? Well, I think that the whole part is that, you know, when you're passionate about the outdoors, you want to share that passion with other people. And, you know, one of the reasons that we started this show, too, is that, you know, for me, you know, all the things in life that have ever happened, you know, it's, you know, everybody knows life is like a roller coaster, goes up, goes down. Anytime that I was on a downward trend, um, that the, the love and the passion for, for the outdoors has always pulled me back to an even pace. And so for me, I love to show people how important it is to enjoy the outdoors, to get outdoors, to get your kids, get your wife, you know, get your friends, get your neighbor involved in this because it's a life-changing situation and it's all for the good. And that's what we need more of in this country. Yeah. Yeah. More, more things for people to, uh, sort of right. come together around it. And also I think from a, a stress level, even scientifically, just being outdoors lowers your stress level. Um, so I wouldn't argue that one, right. <laughs> one bit. Yeah. Right. Um, because it is, it is amazing. You know, I got not to cut you off, Charlie, but it is amazing because the amount of people that I guide every year, and here's an interesting situation. A number of years ago when the economy crashed, I thought the guiding world would like fall apart, you know, because obviously, you know, guiding uh, people, hire guides, uh, it's not cheap. And, you know, obviously when you uh, have an income that you're set on and all of a sudden you get laid off or you get cut back on hours or whatever it is, that you would think that that would be one of them things that you would definitely cut back on. And, uh, and really the funny part is that, Every time the economy kind of goes into a downward trend, actually the guiding business actually picks up more. Does make mm. any sense probably to most people? But you hit it on the on the on the head. Is that obviously when the economy starts going in a downward direction, um, what happens is there's a lot more stress in people's lives, and they need to be able to deal with that stress. And to me, that's what I've learned over all the years of guiding that people come out. And it's a, it's not just catching fish. It, it, it's a stress relief that they need in their life. So really it makes me look at a lot differently when I get people in my boat. Here's something else to think about. And it, it just, a lot of things go through my mind all the time. It's probably because I'm severely ADHD, but here's the thing is that realistically, when you look at, you know, people coming out and spending the day with you, Sometimes, you know, when you do it repetitiously, like I do, like, you know, like before I started the show, I was running way over 300 days a year guiding. And I think sometimes you take that for granted that how lucky you are to be out there every day. So I, I always think to myself, it doesn't matter if it's a first time customer or somebody that's been with me for a long time. I have to remember this is their day. So no matter what's going on on the other side of me at home or anywhere else on my stress level is that I have to get rid of all that when they get in the boat with me and be very positive, be very energ energetic, be very enthusiastic because, you know, it's just, it's to me, it, it sometimes, you, you know, when you do it all the time, it could just be another day of guiding, but to the people that come with me, it is not that way. And that's for me, really the way I look at it is I always try to make it special a special day for whoever is in my boat with me. I love that. I love that. And sometimes I mean, there's a lot I, to that. No, I, 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 I can kind of relate doing uh, the comedy shows and stuff. It doesn't matter what what's going on. These people paid to see you and you put on that show. And sometimes I think you can find or I've found even if I'm in a bad mood, I go do a show because you are purposely putting yourself in a good mood and doing the thing you're trick your brain and now you're all like what what was the issue again <laughs> you know so <laughs> right it, it's kind right. of kind of fun like that you know and but it, it i think anyone can take away from that that you know if things are going wrong you know pretend like they're going right for a little bit and see how that shifts your your mentality 
you know? Yeah, there's a lot of positive thoughts. You, you know that, Charlie. I mean, it's, uh, you know, if we had more positive thoughts, the people that would thought more positively in this country, you know, I uh, just can't imagine how differently things would be. You know, I say this all the time that uh, we are still living in the greatest country in the world, and it is a great day to be alive. Because when you look at the alternative, um, it's not so good because I myself do not know any other place in this whole planet that I would rather live than here in the United States. And certainly, um, you know, one thing you can you can be for sure is that everybody will die, you know. And so you as well enjoy your life while you're here and try to be positive and do as many good things as you can for yourself, but also for others, you know. Mm-hmm. So that's. That, I think that's a, a great way to kind of go through life. And, and you know, uh, like I said before, uh, everybody, I mean, it's amazing. Like some people obviously have a lot more stress in their lives than other people. But, you know, you got to, no matter what's happening in your life, you got to try to find something good and, 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 and grab it, even though sometimes it might be minute um, you know, but you still need to grab that little piece and it's just going to help you stay connected and, and keep things moving forward, you know, hundred percent, hundred percent. Well, Larry, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. And, uh, I hope to get out there and, uh, you know, um, not be the one guy who doesn't catch a sturgeon the next time you go out. <laughs> Okay. Someday, Charlie, my goal <laughs> before I hey before I go up and visit Grandpa Bob, I I thought about this exact, especially for the last year. Is that my goal in life is that I will not succeed until Charlie Barons gets a sturgeon out of the <laughs> ice. Right. So you know, before I I go up there to fish with Grandpa Pop, Bob and his his amazing perch hole, um, <laughs> I'm definitely going to get you that sturgeon. Hey, All the right. other part is Thank real you. quick. Don't forget about maybe some turkey hunting or yeah. uh, early season bow hunt. We got to get you up to the farm, my friend. I would I would love to, and I I love bow hunting especially. So if I if I can get up there and do that, that would be awesome. Okay. Awesome. Hey Charlie, make sure that uh, we would love it if everybody would subscribe to our YouTube channel. Oh yeah, get the check. plugs in. Get the plugs in. What what what's get the YouTube sure. specifically? And if you guys check, yep, just check out Larry Smith Outdoors. We do a new show every week. Uh, on network and on all the social media avenues. Um, we believe in th- this country and we believe in definitely enjoying life. And uh, you know what? It's always good to meet new friends. And Charlie, you know what? We met you a few years ago and you have definitely become a good friend. And we really enjoy your your time that we get to spend with you and uh, definitely the, the time we get to spend with your family. Absolutely. And before before we do go, I just want to say the first time we met, I think it was July of 2018. First time we met in person, early July, as I remember it, uh, you were kind enough to let me bring Grandpa Bob along with when we were shooting that show. He had just the the time of his life out there getting those walleyes. He had a blast. It's one of my one of my great memories with my grandpa. So thank you for facilitating that. And then also when 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 he um. When he passed away, I got a, a few of his shirts and hats. One of his shirts yeah. is his Larry Smith Outdoors shirt, you know, the the double XL. And uh, I thought also, he would have taken that up. With I, you know, he he wanted to be buried in it, but you know, that's oh. kind kind of like you know, you don't want to let him go the six feet under with the good stuff. So you know, <laughs> we took that. And I uh, got 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 his hat, his Larry Smith outdoors hat. So and and That's he just awesome. had the time of his life. And then seeing himself on on TV, he loved it. So thanks for facilitating yeah. that. That was real special. What a great mentor to have as a child growing up. Your grandpa Bob and your dad. You are a very lucky man, Charlie. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Charlie. All right, Larry. Appreciate All right. you. All right, buddy. Yep. We'll thank see you. Ya. Be safe. Yep. You thanks. too. Bye-bye. Bye bye.